Hey, good morning, everybody. Would y'all please stand up to your feet as you could? Let's worship the Lord this morning. Come on, get our hands up. Let's wake up.
Yeah. 
We're so glad that you're here. Welcome if you're worshiping with us online. We love you and we're so glad that you are with us as well. You may be seated. Well, I've got a question for you this morning. And it's the question I think that is so important for us to get the most out of what the Lord has for us. Where's your heart at this morning? Where's your heart at this morning? The fact that you're here at church tells me exactly what it is that you treasure. You treasure the Lord. You treasure spending time with him. And that's why during this time of giving our part of our service that we love here at Woodlands Church, it's all about that. It's all about continuing to demonstrate to the Lord where our heart's at, that we know where we really belong and what we're really citizens of. Just listen to what it says in Matthew chapter six, verses 19 through 21, it says this, don't store up treasures here on earth where moths eat them and rust destroys them and where thieves break in and steal. <laughs> Don't do that. Instead, store your treasures in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. For wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will be also. Where's your heart at this morning? What do you treasure? You know what? If you looked at my screen time, you'd be able to see what kind of things I treasure, where I spend my time. You would see two apps used a lot. They're both sports apps, right? Because I do, I enjoy sports. I love following the Astros trade deadline. Verlander, come back, we're ready for you, right? Whatever. I love following those things and that's okay. And if you looked at that, it'd be easy for you to see that my heart on some level, when it comes to looking at things on my phone or engaged in that, I hope the Bible app would be there as well. But more importantly, when you look at my life, if you're able to see my lifetime over the week, I hope you would see that my things that I treasure the things, times that I spend with my family, the time that I spend investing into ministry, being here at church and investing in the Lord, that it would be obvious to you that my home and my heart is not here on earth. It's focused on those things that are eternal. And the reason we love our time of giving at Woodland Church is because we are about making sure that our hearts are focused on that which is eternal. And so we love to give because we want the Lord to be able to know that we trust him when he says that anything that we invest into church is making an eternal investment that we believe that that eternal reward is coming. You know, and I ask students all the time, I say, if you could see your life two years from now, do you think you'd live your life differently? If you could see exactly what the Lord has planned for you five years from now, do you think you'd live your life differently? Well, I wanna ask that same question to all of us. If you could see your life being lived out a hundred years from now, do you think you'd live your life differently? You see, that's why we love to give here at Woodlands Church, because we know that we know that heaven is coming and we choose to make an investment into that which is eternal because where our treasure is, there our heart will be also. Don't miss out on giving this morning. Don't miss out on reminding the Lord that you treasure him and you trust in his promises. There are so many ways to give here at Woodland Church. You can give online at wc.org slash give. You can also just text the number 77977. It'll shoot you back a text message, or you can and then put in there, give WC, all one word, hit send. It will shoot you back an opportunity for you to give on our online platform, but do give. And I know so many of you, you've already given before you got here. So don't miss during this time to just let your heart be centered and reminded of the fact that we give because we love him because he commands it and because we trust him and because our treasure is in heaven before it's here on earth because that's where nothing can destroy that which we've invested into. Let me pray over our tithes and offerings. God, we love you and we give because we love you because God, your word reminds us this is not our home. We're headed home and God, we wanna make sure that we continue to invest where our home is with you. We long to be there, but today the world will know where our treasure is, our treasure's with you. God, we wanna make sure that our own heart and our own bodies continue to remember that we're invested into your kingdom. Bless this time of giving. May it be 
that you see our hearts are with you and connected to you first and foremost. We love you. It's in your son's name we pray, amen. Well, there are so many ways for you to be invested here at Woodland Church, not only through giving, but also through continuing through your time and your efforts and your resources to minister to those in our community. And one of those ways is through our back pack ministry as we continue to give kids the school supplies they need as they get back to school. And so we've actually been doing that all week. And at the end of service, you're welcome to go out in the lobby and help us pack a backpack for kids who need those back to school supplies. Our young adults and our student ministry have actually already been participating in that this week. And so if you wanna get a glimpse about what God's been doing through our generosity here at Woodlands Church, just check out this video. Yeah, thank God for that. What an incredible ministry. But there are so many amazing ministries happening here at Woodlands Church. I have Dr. Paul Looney here with me, and we have an incredible ministry through our lay counseling ministry that I know he wants to tell you more about and how you can be a part of that on how God just continues to use Woodlands Church to minister to people. So please welcome Dr. Paul. Thank you, Mark. So do you want to learn more about relationships, communication, learn about grief, trauma, depression, anxiety? Want to learn about parenting and marriage? If so, our lay counselor training may be for you. It's five Saturdays spread out from this month through October. If you are interested, we have a table in the lobby. Please check us out. You can get signed up today if you're interested. It is a wonderful way to grow in your faith and in your ability to help people navigate difficult times. Hope you'll join us. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Paul. I appreciate that. Don't miss it. It really is an incredible ministry that I know will bless you and has blessed so many in our church. Well, I want you to know that today, the message is being brought by one of Woodland's church's own. The person who's bringing the message today, I first met in seventh grade on a basketball court at summer camp. And he has grown up through our student ministry and even a part of our kids' ministry. He has an incredible testimony of love he has been poured into here. He has developed and grown right through here. Went to Texas A&M University, but also went to Woodland Seminary here. Has grown up, and I'm telling you, he is passionate, and he's an incredibly gifted communicator, and he's one of us. And I know you're going to be blessed to see what God is doing through Woodland Church as you see how he's raising up. God is raising up leaders for the next generation, just like Pastor Jordan Alpha, who's bringing the word today. You're going to be, you're going to be blessed. But God's not only working through our preachers that he's raising up, but also through Woodlands Worship. We've got Sarah Reeves here with us today, and she's been helping write songs with Woodlands Worship. And so would you stand and let's continue to worship through a new Woodlands Worship song called Wind in the Waves that I know you're going to love. Let's worship together. Amen. As he said, we're going to do a brand new song this morning. We just wrote it a few weeks ago, and it's based on the story in the Bible where Jesus was in the boat with the disciples, and there was a great storm that came, and the disciples were panicking, and they were full of fear and thought they were going to die, and Jesus was asleep in the boat, and they woke him up, and he looked to the sea, and he just said, peace, be still. And the storm left and the waves were calm. And if he can speak to the wind and the waves and they obey him, how much more is he speaking to us as his children? And sometimes there's a storm raging on the inside of us. And sometimes p fear and worry and panic can come over all of us. And so right now I just I feel Jesus in the room. And I just want you to close your eyes as we sing this song over you. And just hear him say, peace, be still. Let the Prince of Peace reign in your hearts and in your mind this morning. Amen. The song is called Wind in the Waves. When I'm up, when I'm down, you're steady. When I'm stuck in the clouds and it's heavy. When my knees hit the ground, you will carry me. You're never shocked, never scared of my questions. 
You don't leave me alone in the trenches I am safe in your arms, in your presence If you say be still, Jesus I will I'm standing with the Prince of Peace If you tell my soul, trust and let go I'll let you calm the storm in me Just like the wind and the waves I will obey Just like the wind and the waves We got to pray after that. That's some awesome worship. God, we love you. God, we thank you. God, we give today to you. I just pray that you can calm my nerves and let us all just have a good time learning from your word. We love you. We thank you. We pray all these things. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. amen. I'll be seated. Y'all be seated. Well, again, my name is Jordan Alpha. Hello, everybody here in the, in the room here in the Woodlands, Atascacita online. We're super glad to be here. I don't know if Mark gave you the full intro, but about nine years ago, Yes, I was raised here at Woodlands Church. I also married the princess of Woodlands Church. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, 
Megan Shook became Megan Alpha, right? And every now and again, Pastor Kerry gets a wild hair and lets me come up here and preach with you. Not on his head. He's very bald. I'm his son-in-law. I get to say that. You don't. It's fine. But I'm super glad. It's been such a fun time just growing up here at Woodlands Church and being a part of what we do here, which I believe is just church. And so I hope it's been a blessing to you here. If you're visiting, if this is your church home, I hope you have embraced what it means to be a church because I love it here. I have grown up here. Small thing about myself. I have always been for my entire life completely obsessed with sports. I watch sports, I play sports, I play sports video games, which means I watch myself play sports on TV. It's weird, I do the whole thing, all right? <laughs> I'm obsessed, always have been. And I'm a homegrown Houston boy, so it's all Houston sports for me. You could take your Dallas Cowboys and get out of here, okay? <laughs> and if anybody's against that, I will pray against you. I'm a pastor now, okay? <laughs> But I love sports, and of all the sports, it's always been basketball. I had it bad, y'all. I'd watch documentaries, I'd get encyclopedias, I'd ditch school and go to like basketball card conventions, okay? It was, yes, I was completely obsessed. I would memorize players' heights, weights, and numbers and where they went to college. I, I don't know why, that information has all stayed too. Fellas, I don't know why we can do that. We can retain completely useless information and our wives wonder, they wonder why do you know so much about Kobe Bryant and don't know anything about your children? <laughs> and I say, I don't know. Lower Marion High School. That's where you went. I didn't go to college, it's fine. But I eventually started playing basketball at an early age, started in second grade, got my first points in fourth grade. It was a big day. Yeah, and eventually got pretty good. I played in junior high, I played varsity basketball a couple years. I played on a travel team and we went all across the nation. We played in gyms, we played in arenas that the pros or college players played in. I've seen the history and prestige firsthand of how awesome this sport of basketball can be. But of all of those places, one of my absolute favorite times to play was something called open gym. You see, in the off-season basketball program, we would go to the track and we would run sprints or you know, we would go to the weight room to get stronger. We would be in the, in the gym doing drills, trying to get better, and it would all come together once or twice a month when the coaches would stay after school and keep the gym open for something called open gym. Oh yeah, I see it, right? And it was awesome. And I remember my very first open gym being a freshman, a ninth grader. We got shuttled over to the varsity campus, the main campus. Me and my buddies were talking about how cool it was gonna be to go toe to toe against all these guys we grew up watching. We knew they have no idea who we are, but we're ready to show them who we are. And as we bust open those gym doors, I remember being super intimidated, seeing two games going and it was intense. Guys were dunking, guys were pushing, guys were diving for loose balls. It's like, oh my gosh, this is a whole nother level. I've never seen anything like this. And then you look up and hovering above all of them, You've got a line of coaches, notes out, taking notes on who's hustling, taking notes on who's knocking down shots, taking notes on who's gonna make the team and who was not. And you're like, oh, duh. No wonder everybody's just going so hard because it's right under their nose. I was so excited to play under that pressure. And I was lacing my sneakers up. Me and my buddies actually got kicked over. We got exiled over to the auxiliary gym. They said, hey, freshman, you got a win to get in. And we said, okay, yes, sir, <laughs> right? And we went over. And the other gym was a completely different story, right? The court was a little dustier. The lights weren't as bright. There was zero adult supervision. So it was an absolute circus. It really was. Nobody cared about winning. Nobody cared about being a good teammate. Nobody cared about anything other than making their friends laugh. It's simple math. You put 14-year-old boys in a room with no adult supervision, and what do you get? In a word, chaos, and that's what it was, right? We were fighting each other, we were pantsing each other, we were fighting each other with our pants, it was crazy, all right? And that's what we did while the game was going on, right? And so we're playing a game, we're goofing around, we're shooting half court shots, trying to impress our friends. Meanwhile, a group of guys one year older than us come in and they are just destroying us. I mean, they're playing with just as much intensity and ferocity as everybody next door and we are like, what is wrong with you? chill out, bro. Let's, this is just fun. We're having a good time. Nothing. They just kept going. They just kept grinding. They just kept pushing us. They just destroyed us. Eventually, when our competitive juices started sinking back up, we started talking a little bit of smack because that's what you do when you play basketball, right? Right? Nice game, tryhards. Hey, it's not like any of this even matters. The coaches don't see it, right? That was the thought. If coach doesn't see this, none of this counts. It's, it's ripped from the ledger. He doesn't know what he doesn't know. So how about you chill out and have some fun? 
nothing, no words. They just kept the beat down going. And after they beat us, they just got out of the gym. They just went next door. And we were so frustrated. One of my buddies shouted and said, hey, we'll see you guys over there. None of that counted. We'll see you in a sec. Nothing. Well, one of their guys was actually getting water after the game. And he calmly turned around. He looked us up and down. And he said, hey, check this out. And he pointed to the corner of the gym where a camera was propped up on a tripod. And he said, coach sees everything. And in shock, we were like, oh my gosh, what the heck are we gonna do? Luckily, this was a camcorder on a tripod, and so we went over and deleted the footage, okay? <laughs> we blamed an assistant coach that he didn't turn it on. It's no big deal, right? But don't you wish you could do that in real life sometimes? Maybe there has been a moment or two in your life where you have been acting a fool, where you have been selfish, you have been rude, you have torn somebody down. Maybe you didn't mean to, but you made a mistake that had devastating consequences. Maybe people were around to see it, but when we really contemplate it and think about it, you know this. Well, God sees everything. We can't go and alter any of life's footage. He doesn't just see it. He knows it before it's even gonna happen. In life, the stakes are way higher than they are in high school basketball. What do we do knowing that there's someone out there who knows everything about us. Not just what we've done, but what we're doing and what we will ever do in the future. He sees it. Yes, he sees every good deed, every good action, every piece of encouragement we give. He also sees every failure, every sin. He knows every hidden motivation in our hearts. There's nothing that escapes God's notice. Today, we're gonna talk about what theologians call God's omniscience, which is a fancy word to say his all-knowingness. God knows everything. There's nothing we can hide from God. He knows everything there is to know about everything. And it is amazing to me to think that all the information in the world, what we can perceive, it's just nothing to God. If you've ever known anybody who's done digital coding or if you yourself have done that, you know that the ones and the zeros come together to see what we can see and hear on a screen. And we'll imagine that for absolutely everything, that God knows every fiber of every cell of every piece of everything that you can, he knows it. That is who this omniscient, all-knowing God is. And it's not just perception, it's thought, it's everything. The Bible says that man's foolishness is Sorry, man's wisdom is just foolishness to God. Why? Because we don't know anything compared to him. God knows everything. There is to know about everything. But more importantly, and more personally, God knows everything there is to know about you. I'd like us all to stand in honor of God's word and let's read uh, our key passage today. It's Psalm 139, verses one through four. Here's what it says. O oh Lord, you have searched me and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise, you perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely, O oh Lord. Let's pray together. God, we love you. God, thank you for today. Thank you that you know us so perfectly that even though we will never deserve your perfect love that you give. I pray that you speak through me. I pray that you allow us to take these words in. I pray that you allow that love. I pray that we can accept that today. I allow, I allow that you, I, I pray that you allow our words to trans, your words to transform our lives, God. We love you. We pray all these things in Jesus' name, amen. You guys can be seated. Well, there's three things in this passage that I wanna highlight. Three things about God's omniscience. There's so much in scripture that we can see towards God's all-knowingness. But I love this passage. And I think if we pick it apart, we can see three distinct things. The first is this. He sees every action. It says, you know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. God knows every action we've ever done. If we've done it, he's seen it. It's like that old Santa Claus song that we used to scare children with, right? He sees you when you're sleeping, but it's way worse, okay? It's just not as creepy, okay? And you're thinking probably if you're anything like me, it's like, whoa, I, there's things that I've done that I'm not too proud of. Seriously, God? Like, you see me in that and you still, how is that possible? 
Well, join the club. I'm right there with you. We are all in the same boat. We are broken. We have made mistakes. And he knows that about us. You can't hide from God. I've got three boys, three beautiful boys. I love them so much. My middle son's name is Rowan, and he is a chip off the old block in every way. He's literally just carbon copy mini me. It's ridiculous. He is a three nager right now, as we say, um, which means he, if you hear about the terrible twos, they warn you about the terrible twos, but then the three nager comes around and it's the terrible twos, but now they think they can talk better. They're working on it, but they just, you know, they can't, you know what I mean? Love them. He's still trying to figure it out, right? In public, I'm a translator for my son. At all times, he will confidently and passionately walk up to anyone and everyone and just say, hey, you miss her, my, my shoe, my fast. And I say, I'm so sorry, ma'am. He says that his shoes make him go fast. And she goes, oh, that's so great. He's so cute. I say, yeah, I know. How did, why, son? Thank you, you know? <laughs> he literally makes friends everywhere. And I'm not, I'm not like an extrovert or introvert. I'm an extra introvert, which means in public, I don't really like to do this whole thing. And I'm a pastor, which is an issue and God's working on me, but it's fine. My son does it for me, okay? Which is a blessing and a curse. Because, Anyways, we'll get into that later. If you see me in public, can you be the initiator? Just help me, that's my flesh. Anyways, I would love to see you. Rowan does this at all times. And for the longest time in public, and if you've got toddlers, you know that in public, the interactions, we try to be nice and cool. But for the longest time, his favorite word was no. And it's actually the only word that he really would ever use. And I would try to like out Tetris him in my brain and be like, Rowan, you wanna go to bed? No. Do you wanna stay up all night? No. Got it. Let's go. Do you want to not wear your jammies? No. Okay, that means, okay, sweet. And it would work. And I would try to coach my mom up, but she would just set herself up for failure. She'd be like, Rowan, you want to, she's G-Ma to my kids. You want to come to G-Ma's house? No. I'm like, mom, stop talking. Rowan, do you like going to G-Ma's house? No. Mom, please, you don't know what you're doing. Do you like G-Ma? No. And just like, of course he likes you. I'm so sorry. Just all he can say. And in this season, I remember coming home one day from work. I open the door. I get tackled by my children. It's every day, y'all. And I look on the ground, and I see there's a bag of Oreos just ripped open, ravaged. I'm like, golly, those stupid dogs. But when I look up, I see that my sons have actually gotten into something they probably shouldn't have, right? And I say, Rowan, he's always the ringleader. He's not even the oldest. I say, Rowan, did you get, did you get into some cookies? No! Rowan, did you eat some of the cookies? That right there. No, I wasn't. I know. Rowan, it's okay. You can talk to me. Did you have any of the cookies? No, I didn't have any of the cookies. And the tantrum starts. He starts throwing stuff. He's going crazy. Well, look, this is who I was talking to in that moment. Okay? <laughs> one, very, one very hard, right? <laughs> to just look into that and be like, Rowan, I don't, I know. I know that you ate cookies. That or your brother high-fived you with cookies. It's in your face. I don't know. But you had him. He thought he could hide from me. And I'm an imperfect father. And I don't know everything. And I know one day he will be able to hide things from me. And there's a part of me that's really heartbroken by that. Because I don't want him to. We try to hide things from the God of the universe all the time. How much more does our heavenly father see right through us? We think that if we hide, we think that if we don't bring it up, we think that if we just keep it in the dark, then God won't see it or God won't care, but he does. He sees it and he does, he cares. Whether we like it or not, God sees every action. We can also see in Psalm 39 that he hears every word. Before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely, O oh Lord. Everything you say, he hears it before you say it. Everything you say, he hears it before you say it. And we all have said things that we wish we could take back. Have you ever said something that you immediately regretted? Like, like just the second it goes out, you're like, no, don't, no. And you just watch that word bubble just bounce around the room like a deadly projectile, right? I've heard it said that trying to take back a word you've said is like trying to put toothpaste back in the tube. It's always messy and you always look like an idiot. 
it just happens. You say something, you regret, and then you try to recount your words. You say, no, I didn't mean it that way. And they're like, but you said it. They say there's truth behind every joke. And you're like, come, what is going on, right? We say this to our friends. We say this to our family, especially with our significant others. Words are dangerous, and sometimes we misuse them. Sometimes we abuse them. Every word that we've said that tears somebody down, every piece of criticism, once the juicy gossip starts getting shared, there's no way that we can take that back. There's no way that we can go and make it as if nobody ever heard it. We definitely don't want that person to hear what we said, and we definitely don't want the God of the universe to know what it was that we said, but everything we say, God hears. The third thing we can see in this passage is that he knows every thought. I think this is the scariest part. Not only does he see every action and hear every word, but he knows everything we're thinking. King David wrote in Psalm 139, I'm an open book to you. Even from a distance, you know what I'm thinking. I mean, that's amazing. It is terrifying, but amazing that for everything that you've ever thought, and not just you, but everything I've ever thought. Not just me and you, but everything that anyone has ever thought ever. God knows those things. He is omniscient. He is all-knowing. He knows every word before you're going to say it. He knows every action before you do it. He knows every thought. How unfathomable is that? And I believe that spiritual warfare is real. I believe that there's a tempter who does tempt, and I don't think every thought is our own, but I have absolutely entertained thoughts in my mind that I am not proud of. He knows those things. Think about it. Let's just say that everything you've ever done, everything you've ever said, everything you've ever thought, let's just say those things were plastered up on a big screen for the whole world to see. I'm sure there'd be some highlights that you'd be pretty proud of and just be like, hey, that was me. I did that. You didn't believe me, but I did do that. So there it is. But what about the low lights? What about all the low lights? I mean, that's the sports center, not top 10 from hell, right? For you to have to relive that, for you to have to share that with other people, to think that God's got all that, he knows that. That is a terrifying thought, but he's got it. He knows it. There is nothing we can hide from God. What is it that we choose to hide away? Maybe there's deep hurts or betrayals in your friendships, in your marriages, with your siblings. Maybe you have shameful or greedy, lustful thoughts that you just sit on and let, and let destroy your life. Maybe you've said words or somebody has said words to you that have done serious damage and you're spending so much time and energy trying to prove them wrong or trying not to prove them right that we can't actually get on with our life because we're so held back by everything that has ever happened to us and everything that we have ever done. God knows all of these things. He knows how we failed time and time again. He knows what we've done. He knows why we did it. And he even knows how we had to justify it to ourself and to other people. We can't hide from God, but there's good news. We don't have to hide from God because the God who knows everything, the God who has this all-knowingness, this omniscience, this God who knows all there is to know about us loves us unconditionally. You don't have to earn God's love. You don't qualify, it, you know, qualify for it for being a good enough Christian. No, he gives it to you unconditionally. It is freely given. You can't earn it. God's hope is that you can relax in this thing called grace, this free gift, this free love that you can't earn. Not that we're so wound up by all of these thoughts of who we are and what we've done and, and how we've been wronged and all of it. No, that there's grace that covers the multitude of sin. There's grace that covers the multitude of failure. There's grace that covers the multitude of weakness. And we can relax in that knowing that we are loved that we are enough, not because of anything we've done, but because of who he is and what he has done. Yes, he is all knowing, but with that knowledge, he is all loving. God's grace covers all your sin because Christ came and died for you and he gave his life for you. We earn separation and death, but he paid the price for that on the cross. He, pray, he paid that price so that we could be his once again to stop hiding 
to stop putting the things that he knew about in between our relationship with him. His unconditional love and forgiveness was given to us so we could stop hiding and we could just come and be with him. There's no reason to hide from God who loves you just the way you are. We hear about this grace and it sounds too good to be true. What do we do with this perfect grace? How does this change our lives? How does this affect our everyday? Well, hear me out. The first thing that we can learn about this grace is this, the grace of God accepts me just as I am. God accepts us just the way we are. He's accepting and he's encouraging. It says this in Romans 5, 8. But God put his love on the line for us by offering his son in sacrificial death, get this, while we were of no use whatever to him. Thank you, Paul. That is just some harsh words right there. But God loves you just the way you are. God died for us when we couldn't give anything back to him. Human beings, since the dawn of time, since the beginning of creation, ever since we ate that dang apple, we have been perfecting conditional love. But God has unconditional love. We love people with strings attached. We love people with a love that says, I love you if. I love you if you love me back. I love you if you do these certain things. I love you if you meet my needs. I love you if you change. I love you if you stay the same. We're all over the place. Human beings, selfish, imperfect love is a love that loves if, but the love of God loves you just where you are. The love of God knows no if. I love you no matter what. I love you just the way you are. That's what God's grace is all about. And I'm so grateful that Woodlands Church is a church of grace. We've always said there's no room for perfect people here. Why? Because we're all just a bunch of strugglers trying to follow the one who is perfect. And if you think you're perfect, you've already sinned just there. Boom, right? <laughs> but no, we're broken. That's what church is. It's a bunch of broken people coming together to honor and worship a perfect God. There's nobody perfect. We need to admit that to ourselves. We need to know that about ourselves. We need to stop hiding our faults. Stop hiding our weaknesses. Embrace them. Not in a way that says, look at me, I can do anything. I'm the worst, yay. But look at who God loves. If God can love me, then I know God can love you. That's how grace affects our life. We take these thoughts, we take these actions, we take these words, these failures that we've had, and we take them directly to Jesus Christ, who loves us just the way we are. And this is so cool. The Bible says, if I don't hide my sins, but I confess them, then he forgives me and he cleanses me from every wrong. I love a good if then in the Bible. That's a promise. Let's read it one more time, just like that. The Bible says, if I don't hide my sins, but I confess them, then he forgives me and he cleanses me from every wrong. What is the promise of God for you? Do you wanna be cleansed from those wrongs? If we confess them, if we stop hiding. You don't have to hide. Why? Because he loves you just the way you are. What's the second thing that we see about grace? Grace gives us the power to change. Grace gives me the power to change. It says this in Philippians 2.13. For God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. When we come to Jesus Christ, he accepts us just the way we are, but he loves us too much to let us stay that way. If we don't accept God's grace, I know for me, if I didn't accept God's grace in my life, then I would have forever been stuck in my selfish pattern of sin of choosing myself over other people. I would have continued to live the way I had always lived. I believe as human beings, that is our default setting. Not that we are the worst, but I do believe that there is a brokenness and a fall in this world. The fall of man is real because God says it's real and I have testified to that in my own life. And if I didn't accept that grace, if I didn't walk in that grace, then I would never change. And it's not because, oh, Pastor Jordan, you're so disciplined and you're so spiritual. Heck no, techno. It's because of God's grace that I have seen subtle change in my life. I am just as broken as you are, people. You've probably already seen so. But we need God's grace to change. Somebody once told me that when you become a Christian, you can never successfully sin again. What do they mean by that? Well, when you let Jesus into your heart, you receive the Holy Spirit. And with the Holy Spirit brings conviction. God won't let you get away with your old selfish ways because he loves you too much. 
I love the way it is put in, Hebrew, in Hebrews 12, 6 in the message translation. I think this is so cool. Don't shrug off God's discipline, but don't be crushed by it either. It's the child he loves that he disciplines. The child he embraces, he also corrects. God loves you too much to keep you right where you are. It's because of grace that we are freely given the power to change. The Bible says God gives grace to the humble, but he opposes the proud. When I humble myself and I say, God, I need you to give me the power to change. I need you to give me the power to love. I need you to give me the power to do the things that you ask me to. Then he fills us up with his power and his strength. Christ found me in the middle of my mess. I know Christ found you in the middle of your mess. He did not say, you clean your act up and then maybe I'll love you. Clean your act up and then maybe I'll accept you. Clean your act up and then maybe you will be worthy for me to come and die for you. Maybe then I'll save you. No, while we were still in our mess, while we were still sinners, Christ reached down, he picked us up, he held us close, he forgave us. He has a love that says, I love you. You're my child. He finds us in our mess. He comes to us, but he doesn't just leave us there. He gets in our mess and he offers us his help out of it. Titus 2, verses 11 and 12. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and world passions to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. What is, the, what is the scripture saying? It is the grace of God that teaches us. It is an experience. It's not the school of hard knocks. That's what we think. Oh, you've been a Christian for so long, therefore you don't sin anymore. No. It is how well do you cling to God's grace? It is how well do you embrace the fact that you are broken and lean on and support your life upon God's word and God's teaching and allow the Holy Spirit of God to be what changes you. When we are in the atmosphere of God's grace, in this atmosphere where we're totally accepted, we no longer have to be held hostage by fear and shame. We will gain a desire to change when we're in the atmosphere of grace. When someone is nitpicking you and criticizing you, does that make you wanna change? That does nothing for me. It doesn't. And it absolutely does nothing for my wife. If anything, it makes us both wanna just spite the other person and just be even worse, right? Get your foot off the table. Swing the other one on there too. You know what I mean? I don't know why, but it does. Husbands, wives, if you're constantly nagging at your mate, you know it doesn't work. You are my favorite, one of my favoritely true statements because this, the actual statement itself is ridiculous because it never works. Have you ever told someone to calm down? <laughs> what is the success rate on that? I'm thinking it's a wild zero. You know what I mean? But when someone is always just on your case, right? It doesn't make you wanna change. That's not what God does. He brings encouragement. Encouragement is believing in someone and then showing them. Encouraging is, is, is dreaming with someone about who they are, about what they can be, where they can go, what you believe they can do. That's what God's grace did for me. He spoke promises over my life. He, he, he told me who I really was and where I was supposed to go in my life. And not that I had to be good enough to do it, but that he was gonna show me. He was gonna provide for me. He was gonna give me everything I needed to do. That grace accepts me as I am. Grace gives me the power to change. But there is a third thing. And this is something, church, that I'm so passionate about. This is a, a, a pillar in my life, something that has absolutely shifted everything that I do. Grace is what connects me with others. When I experience God's grace, it makes it a whole lot easier to extend grace to other people. I always say that my marriage is a testament to forgiveness and grace. Why? Because Megan and I have both failed each other so many times, but it's through God's grace that we have a closeness. Romans 15, seven. Accept one another then, just as Christ accepted you in order to bring praise to God. We're to accept each other just the way we are. 
In college, I was one of those guys who had way too many roommates, all right? In my three and a half years in College Station, I had nine different roommates. You know, we were just packing in like sardines to just save a buck on rent, okay? And though roomies would come and go, I was always under the same roof as my best friend, Chad. Him and I grew up together. We were raised in the student ministry here together, and we went through so many of life's journeys together. Side note, when Megan, and when I was proposing to Megan, before this, I had this wildly romantic idea, thank you God for giving me that, to have our close friends and our family write a letter to her, encouraging her, saying why she was so amazing and why they were so excited for this next season of life, all of these awesome things. And her friends and family did a great job. You know, they threw one or two pages together of heartfelt, encouraging words. It was wonderful. Her parents came back three or four pages. I'm like, whoa, we get it. You're authors. That's awesome. (laughs) Chad hands me a single-spaced, front-and-back, 10-page novel to my future bride-to-be, okay? I absolutely had to proofread this. <laughs> On proofreading, I find out that pages five through eight are completely unreadable due to tear stains, okay? What is going on here, fella, you know? But as I read it, as I dive in, I see that this is everything that Megan needs to know to see that this guy's like a brother to me that we have forged a deep bond. And I love him, but that was hard work. He knows because I'm super broken and I know because he's probably even more broken. No offense, Chad. But you see, our life was changed. Our, Our friendship changed drastically through one specific conversation in college. We were encouraged one weekend at church to go and, you know, to extend grace towards other people, to know what God sees about us and oh, and go and open up to someone, you know, this whole thing, right? And we started to have a conversation. And in that conversation, we shared, oh yeah, I'm struggling with lust and pride and school's super hard. And as we were going through this surface level conversation, we realized that God wasn't being honored by that. We weren't even getting any closer from that. If anything, we just were reminding them of things that we had said, you know, in passing or in Bible studies or subtle things here and there. It was nothing new. It was nothing real. It was nothing deep. So we talked about that. We decided, okay, fine, let's dive a little bit deeper. Not just to honor ourselves, but to honor God. This is, if God has really put this on our hearts, then let's actually go for this. And so we did. And and I would share and say, you know what? I am struggling with lust, but I've got an addiction to pornography. I don't go a day without looking at it. In college, it was wrecking my life. It was ruining my relationships. It was getting in the way of my relationship with Megan at the time. I struggle with pride and comparing myself to other people, you know, physically, spiritually, and especially with Chad. I mean, he was my best friend. He's the person that I constantly compared myself to. We had that conversation, an impossible conversation. And every time I opened up just a little bit more, I felt myself wincing and just being ready to just be absolutely obliterated with rejection or hate or frustration or accusal, anything and everything. I was ready for it. I was so afraid of that, but we just kept diving deeper. Likewise, as he shared with me all of the stuff that he was really going with, I remember feeling nothing but just compassion, hurt, not from him, but for him, that my best friend in the world was carrying all this stuff, that he felt for the longest time that he couldn't share those things with me. By the end, we were rolling on the floor laughing. Why? Because we had been freed from all of this stuff that had just been in the dark in our lives. No one had really seen us. No one except for God. And when God put it on our hearts to share that with someone, we were able to experience something that as mind-blowing as this is, is what God experiences with us on a daily basis. And that is to be fully known, to be fully seen and fully accepted. That is no small thing. What is so powerful about God's omniscience? about his all-knowingness. Yes, he knows absolutely everything there is to know about science and nature, and he created all, it's awesome. But those things are not as important to him as you are. Things don't go to heaven, people go to heaven, and God knows his people, and he knows every detail about you. 
He knows every hurt that you carry. Why? Because they're his hurts too, because he loves you. He has nothing but compassion for you. That is who God is. And when we accept that grace, when we know who we are in God's eyes, it allows us to see people that way, not that they have to be good enough for us, We can stop offering them the conditional love that this world has to offer and we can represent the God of the universe and offer an unconditional love that says, forget the ifs, I just love you. I just accept you. We share in the grace that was given to us. When you know that, when you know that you are loved, you can not by your own power, when you trust that you are loved. You cannot by your own power share the grace that God has given us. Then that grace allows us to love and connect with other people. This is a big deal right here, church. There is a huge difference between acceptance and approval. And we have to get this right. The church has a bad rep on this. Christians have been doing this poorly for a long time. There is a big difference between acceptance and approval. We are to accept everyone just the way they are. Why? Because that's the way Jesus accepted us. The Bible says while we were still in our sins, he accepted us. He didn't wait for us to clean up our act. He didn't wait for us to be perfect, to do everything just right. No, he loved us just the way we were. But he didn't have to approve of our sin to accept us. God did not condone our sins. He had to go to the cross for our sins. He had to die for our sins, an excruciatingly painful death. It isn't that he condones. It isn't that he approves of our sin, but he does accept us just the way we are. That is the love that we're supposed to share with the world. There's a verse in Romans. It's Romans 2.4. It's a, it's a verse that has changed my life. It's a, it's a verse that I say has wrecked my heart. Why? Because it talks about the word tolerance. Ugh. The worst. But it's kindness, it's patience, and it's tolerance. That is what won you over to Christ. That is what we are to offer to people. Kindness that puts other people's needs first. Tolerance that loves people enough to let them choose for themselves. And patience that never gives up on people. That's what God's grace is all about. And God's grace is life-changing. If we allow it to accept us just where we are, to change us with the power of Jesus and connect us with other people, then we will be able to experience the peace that comes from being fully known and fully accepted by God. We get to experience intimacy with God and we get to share that intimacy with other people. Hear me, whether they accept it or not, we are to love them just the way they are. I'll leave you with this. I've decided to call this my patent pending three-step test for choosing grace in your life. Are you ready? It's super easy. Number one, get honest with God. Forgiveness is found when we bring our troubles to Jesus. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. You're not gonna surprise God with what you have to bring to the table he already knows. Step two, get honest with yourself. This is difficult. It seems like it would be the easy one, but it's not. You might have to go back and you might have to stir up some old hurts. We have to admit our brokenness. We have to admit our faults. When we trust that we are acceptable, not by anything that we've earned, but by God's grace, then God will open our eyes to feel confident that Jesus has come to clean up our mess. He did so not because we deserved it, but because he just loves us. When we get that through our heads, we can be real with ourselves and with God. We can stop trying to be perfect or put up this perception that we're perfect and we can just be present. Step three, get honest with others. James 5, 16 says this, therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. There is powerful in sharing our burdens with fellow believers. We don't need their forgiveness for our salvation. Now that comes only through confession to God, through getting real with God. That is where our salvation is found, but God uses it. What did James 5 say? We can find healing 
We can find victory over our sin when we allow other people in. We can have accountability. We give authority in our life to other people to say, look, when I'm by myself, I choose wrong. I need God's help and I need your help. Will you pray with me? Will you hold me accountable on this thing? Here's my phone. I, I hate looking at these things that I wanna look at all the time, but I'm broken. Can you put some passcodes and restrictions on there? I gotta tell you, y'all, I'm a pastor. I'm a, I'm a father of three. And at 9.30 every night, my smartphone becomes a dumb phone because I need that. My wife loves me enough to know that I have a broken, fallen flesh, that I have a history with lust, a history with a porn addiction, and I need that help. It is only through coming and being real with her after I had been so real with God and he had brought victory into my life that I can actually go and find real victory. There's a lot of conversations, church, that we need to have. Spouses, there's a lot of conversations. What are you hiding? What's the point of hiding? Are we so content with disconnection that we would rather hide and not be seen? God accepted you. Are you content with an unloving marriage? Are you content with marriages that, that in the marriage bed that it does nothing for your, for your relationship? Are we going there? Yeah, we're going there. Because it's important to God that you can experience this intimacy, but that experience only comes from an intimacy that comes from being real, first with God, then with ourselves, and then with other people, but only when you can accept just how acceptable you are in God's eyes. Parents, are you, are you content with your kids not being able to tell you what's going on in their lives? I know that's not all on you, but what they need is grace from you. Yes, they're gonna mess up, just like you have, when we can get real and accept our kids for who they are. We don't have to condone or approve of everything that they do, but to accept them and to show them and offer them the grace that you've been shown, that's when victory is had. That's when they can start living out the dream that God has put on your heart for them. Woodlands Church, I'm passionate about this because it has changed my life drastically. You know, after service, we're gonna have a pretty cool time, a time of prayer. And, 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 and I encourage you and I invite you to all go out into the lobby. We were gonna go to the Cross Fountains, but it's like 175 degrees outside. So we'll keep it in the AC. Atascacita, this is for you too. Our prayer teams will be ready for you. Online, click that pray button and connect. We want to pray with you. Let's connect, hear me. This is no small encouragement. Chains will be broken today. Are you tired of hiding? Stop hiding. Go get real with God. Be real with yourself. Let's pray. If God can accept you, we can too. We're here to receive you. We're here to love you. We are here to pray with you. Stop hiding and let's get real. Let's get real with God, the God who already knows everything. If you can accept that you're acceptable, then we can do it. There's power and bringing what was once hidden into the light. So let your light shine, Woodlands Church. That is my hope. That is my prayer. That is how we do church. I don't want you to just come here and just be a consumer of church, to just be a warm body in a seat. I want you to be known here. I want you to feel accepted here. I want you to be a part of what we believe is a family here. And I know it's a big church, but that means if we get it right, then we can make a huge difference and an impact in a community that needs it so bad. Woodlands Church, we can do this, not by our own power, but by the grace that God has given us, we can be a part of this, but it starts with us. We have to be real. So let's go pray. Live in the light because the, the reward is great. And some of you need to hear that today, that the reward is great. You've been doing a great job of this. You've been living in the grace that God has given you. You've been sharing that grace with other people and they're not seeing it. Well, God does. I know that it can be so draining to love people unconditionally in a world that just doesn't get it. God sees you and he will reward you. It's just like Mark said in the offering. We're storing up our treasure in heaven because that is when it will all come together perfectly. We get to see glimpses here and now. We get to be the difference, not by our own power, but by the power of a God who loves us so 
much. He will fill you up. It is by his grace. That is what he wants to use to motivate us and inspire us to keep on keeping on. Remember to cling to God's grace. We need it just as much as everybody else. Well, church, I love you. And this is such an honor. I would love to pray. But before that, let's go into our last passage. It says this in Colossians 3, 23 and 24. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not human masters. Since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward, it is the Lord Christ you are serving. Let's pray. Thank you, Jesus, for your grace. It's difficult for us to accept it at times, God, but we do. At least we make every effort we can. God, that you love us, not because of anything we've ever done, God, but you love us despite of so many things. God, you love us just the way we are. That is, that is so hard to accept, God, but we do. We, we accept that you love us, that you see us, that you know us. God, I thank you for your grace. I thank you that you give us the power to change through your grace. I pray over everyone within the sound of my voice that we are inspired by this grace. We are inspired to stop hiding from you. We are inspired to spend more time with you. We acknowledge just how little we know about your perfect love. Teach us more. Grant us the discipline. Grant us the, the energy, God, the confidence to go and to, to dive into your word and to learn about you more and to be seen and to see you, God. That's what we long for. Continue to change us with your power. Draw us closer together as a community. We love you, Jesus. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name.